Well, good morning, church. Hey, let's have a good Sunday morning. I'm glad to be with you right where you are. Let's worship the Father together. Y'all ready to sing this morning? Let's go. Hey, you look good. <laughs> let's go. What does it mean to be saved? Is it more than just a bread pray? More than just a way to heaven? What does it mean to be his? To be formed in his life? because God said so. That's all that matters. Listen, this next song says, who am I that the highest king would welcome me? Come on, Chinaso. Free indeed, 
grateful you chose to join us here today. Before we get started, would you pray with me? Lord, I believe sincerely this is the message for the hour. I believe this is something that's very important, not just to where we are as a people, as a nation, and as Christians, but also, Lord, it really gets to the heart of how we're to interface with a broken world. As we dive into what it means to meet the world where they are with what they need, I pray, God, that you will give us open hearts and open minds to receive the truth that you have for us today. In your name I pray, amen. You know, there are some Christians today who imagine themselves to be at war with culture and the world around us. They see themselves in a battle for the soul of our nation and believe only one side is going to emerge victorious and it isn't the side that refuses to fight. But by embracing this culture war paradigm, many of these Christians adopt what you would call an all's fair and love and war perspective. After all, in a war, you don't turn the other cheek. You strike back as hard or harder than your opponent because that's how wars are won. Even though it was Jesus who told us how to fight evil, they're more than willing to throw away Jesus' teachings and justify it all in the name of war. These are believers who live off a steady stream of outrage. You know them. You can see it all over their social media accounts. They mock those on the other side. They use sarcastic memes, uh, name calling, condescending language, forgetting that the Bible tells us that we're supposed to communicate with outsiders with gentleness and respect and to walk in wisdom toward outsiders, according to Colossians, by letting our speech always be gracious. The problem with the culture war thinking is not necessarily that these believers are wrong about the, what the ills of society actually are, but it's about how they're choosing to respond to it. We forget this fundamental truth about the nature of the war we're engaged in. Paul reminded us of this. He said, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, make no mistake about it, we are at war, but our battle is a spiritual one. Now, some people would ask, well, well, shouldn't we oppose the evils in our society? And the answer is a resounding yes. 
But the first question is, are we seeking to destroy or rescue our opponents? Because the answer to that question determines how you fight. Here's the truth we must never forget. We are not at war with our ideological opponents. We're at war for them. To engage our culture in a militant and hostile manner is really to forsake our role as ambassadors. It means we trade our diplomatic visas for military dog tags. As, counter, as counterintuitive as it might seem, the fire of human hatred can only be overcome by the spark of God's love. In other words, we win our neighbors with the same love that won us. So in today's message, I want to show you a brilliant example of this from the life of the Apostle Paul. Then after that, I want to talk to you about how we're supposed to engage in a broken world in God's way. So first, let's talk about responding appropriately to the things that unsettle us. The story I want to look at today is from the book of Acts. And it's all about this intersection where our values and the values of the world collide. So in Acts 17, Paul was waiting in Athens and did what most tourists do when they're in Athens. He went sightseeing. Athens was known for the great temples of the Acropolis and the Parthenon, which was considered to be one of the most beautiful buildings in all the world. In fact, there's a replica of the Parthenon in Nashville, Tennessee, across the street from Vanderbilt University. It really is spectacular. In Athens, there were also theaters and marketplaces everywhere. But even more than the richly ornamented buildings, what stood out to the Apostle Paul was the idolatry. One ancient writer tells us that at this point in history, there were nearly 30,000 gods in Athens, which means there were idols and shrines literally everywhere you looked. So much so that Peteronius, he's an ancient historian, said, it's easier to find a god in Athens than a man. Which leads us to this first point. Some things should make us angry. Listen to how the Bible describes what happened. The longer Paul waited in Athens for Silas and Timothy, the angrier he got. All those idols, the city was a junkyard of idols. So Luke tells us that when Paul saw this rampant idolatry, he got mad. The Greek word that's used to describe Paul's anger is the word from which we get this word parasism. Now, Paul experienced a parasism, which is like an emotional storm raging in his heart. In other words, when Paul saw what was happening, it tore him up. People weren't being set free. They were being held captive to their fears and their views of God that were unworthy of God. Because what idols do is they twist and distort. They really sabotage the pursuit of God. This was not something Paul could just walk away from or laugh off. He feels like Someone would feel if someone insulted your wife or your husband or your child, he's offended for God. You got to remember, anger is good. Anger is understandable. But too many of us get angry and focus it on the wrong people. We've got the right anger, but we choose the wrong battlefield. For far too many Christians today, our target becomes the world. And that's because we've forgotten. They're not the real enemy. They're victims of the enemy. Our enemy is not flesh and blood. Our enemy is not human. Our enemy is the evil one behind the evil. And if we forget that, we paint a target on the wrong people and then push them away with our anger, away from God and deeper into their error. When Paul saw the idolatry in Athens, what did he do? Did he organize a Christian boycott of the Athens marketplaces? Did he walk around the city with a placard that read, God hates idols? Did he preach a turn or burn sermon, you know, start anew or it's barbecue? Is that how Paul responded? Of course not. He didn't do any of those things. What Paul does is actually the complete opposite. Even though he is deeply provoked, he goes up to Mars Hill and he compliments the Athenians. He says, I can see that you're a very religious people. I can see that you have a deep spiritual hunger. In other words, Paul's anger was channeled into love. He knew that idolatry desecrates God, no doubt, but he also remembered that idolatry desecrates people too. Paul was called to love people, so he redirected his anger into a passion to help those who were trapped in idolatry. Bottom line, Paul didn't see this city as a battlefield. He saw it as a mission field. Paul sensed a hunger in the Athenians, a hunger for the God they couldn't find. 
When you look around at what is anti-God in our society, of course, that should provoke you. But does it provoke you enough to do something to help those and save those who are trapped in that kind of thinking? Or does it only make you want to judge them? Which leads me to this, find common ground to lead others to higher ground. So here's what happened next. Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an object with this inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. Here's the truth. Our hearts were made to seek God. And Paul found evidence of that even in their idolatry, especially when he came across this shrine to the unknown God. You see, God had already been at work in Athens long before Paul ever got there. God had begun preparing their hearts by showing them that maybe there was something more than what they were settling for. What Paul experienced in Athens that day is still going on today. People are restless. They seek what doesn't satisfy. And God has left witnesses to himself everywhere, in books, magazines, movies, and music. We need to be good students of our culture. That way, we can do like what Paul did. We need to listen to what our culture is saying and to understand the shape of that hunger so that we can bring them to Christ. If you want to share the good news of Jesus Christ, you really have to learn to look past obscene t-shirts and tattoos and four-letter words that you don't like in order to address the inner need which is crying out to be filled by the love of Christ. You know, it was Blaise Pascal who once said, there is a God-shaped vacuum inside each one of us. Another way of saying it would be, there's an altar to an unknown God in every heart. Now, Paul, he could have allowed that provocation in his spirit to distort his thinking and enrage his heart. Instead of saying they were very religious, he might have accused the Athenians of being grossly idolatrous. Instead of speaking neutrally about their objects of worship, he could have described them as detestable idols. But Paul is making a choice to accommodate them as much as possible without compromising his own convictions. So Paul never turned his eyes away from what he saw in the streets. Instead, he deliberately acquainted himself with their beliefs and their background. He respected their heritage without compromising what he himself believed. Some of you might recognize the name E. Stanley Jones. He was an American Methodist missionary to India. He became friends with Gandhi and even wrote a biography of Gandhi that Dr. Martin Luther King read that inspired him to nonviolence. One time, Jones asked Gandhi what missionaries, what Christian missionaries could do to make Christianity more acceptable in India. This is what he asked. He said, what would you, as one of the Hindu leaders of India, tell me, a Christian, to do in order to make this possible? Gandhi's, Gandhi's answer was really direct. This is what he said. First, I would suggest that all of you Christians, missionaries and all, must begin to live more like Jesus Christ. Second, Practice your religion without adulterating it or toning it down. Third, emphasize love and make it your driving force, for love is central in Christianity. Fourth, study the non-Christian religions more sympathetically to find the good that is within them in order to have a more sympathetic approach to the people. Gandhi's response sounds a whole lot like what the Apostle Paul modeled in this passage. Make love your driving force. Find common ground in the things that others believe. Notice Gandhi himself said, don't water down your beliefs. Be Christians. Be fully Christians. I mean, Gandhi really got it. He understood New Testament teaching better than many Christians do. Here's something else Paul did that we too must learn to do, and that is to speak the truth about God. Here's what the Bible says next. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. And he does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. What's Paul saying here? Well, first what he's saying is that God is a maker and not the one who was made. God was not created by human hands. He's the one who has made us and everything that exists in the universe. He is the originator of all things. All things came from his hands. He is the maker and not the one who was made. Second, God is the giver. And he doesn't have any needs himself, which means God is not looking for anything from humans like idolatry and paganism taught. 
In idolatry, people had to bring gifts to their God. They had to do things for their God. They had to sacrifice to their God. People today are still doing the same thing. The gods we worship today still make demands upon us. Money is a God for some people. Fame is a God to others. You can have an idolatrous relationship with your body or even with being liked. Even self-fulfillment can become a God. But whatever your idol, it will make constant demands of you. Paul reverses this sort of thinking. He says, the real God is the God who gives. And then he said this, God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him, we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Now those phrases, in him we move and live and have our being, and the other one, we are his offspring, are actually quotations from Greek writers. Paul applied those references to Yahweh, to the God of the Bible. But did you know that both of those statements were originally written about Zeus in the books that Paul's quoting? I mean, we have these books. Zeus was considered to be the supreme god of the Greeks. The first quote comes from a poem by a man named Epimenides. He's a Cretan, he's from Crete, where the words were addressed to Zeus by his son. The second book derives from a book by a guy named Phenomena of Eratus, and he's a Sicilian, and his work opens with these words, let us begin with Zeus. So, so get this, Paul knows the Greeks well enough to have studied their writings. Then Paul applies those same statements they made about their God to the one true God of the universe. That's because Paul knows that all truth is God's truth. Oh, sure, the Greeks were incorrectly ascribing this truth to Zeus, but Paul is saying, on this point, you nailed it. That's as right as it gets when it comes to understanding God's basic nature. This is the God you worship, but you don't yet know his name. Now, this brings up a very important point. Your ideological enemy is seldom 100% wrong. Hardly anyone ever is. Most ideas, even the ones you detest, have some element of truth to them. So the question is, can you see and affirm truth when you hear it? You see, some of us are so reactive when it comes to the things we disagree with that we don't listen and we refuse to acknowledge truth when we hear it because it comes from the mouth of our enemy. Paul tells the Athenians that our hearts were made to seek after God. In fact, Paul even said, God is not far from you. You see, they had pieces of the truth here and there, and those bits of truth could be pieced together like a roadmap to lead them back to God. Bottom line, we need to be provoked by the idolatry of our day, provoked enough to do something loving for God. We need to affirm truth where we find it. Paul made a point of understanding his audience, finding out their fears, finding out their needs, finding out their history, their culture, their traditions, their philosophy. We need to become fluent in speaking the language of outsiders. Then finally, what Paul did was this. He introduced people to Jesus Christ. At the close of Paul's talk, this is what he had to say. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he, was, he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Paul says, one day we're all going to stand before this God I've been describing, and we're going to give an account of our life. And he's already appointed one who will be our judge. He is uniquely qualified to be judged since he's the only human being in history to rise from the dead. He's talking about Jesus Christ. Paul unapologetically preaches Jesus. So do I. It's okay for you to have your beliefs. It's okay for you to feel strongly about what you believe. I mean, I know what I believe and I know why I believe it. I know Jesus is real because I've walked with him for the past 47 years. Some people think that to relate well to outsiders, I have to water down what I believe. Nothing could be further from the truth. Even Gandhi said, you Christians should practice your religion without adulterating it or toning it down. He's right. There's nothing worse than a Christian who's not 100% sold out to Jesus. The world doesn't expect you to be anything other than what you are. Be who you are and let them be who they are. The most compelling thing about Christianity is someone who lives and believes it fully. And the most unappealing thing in Christianity are those who live it halfway and willingly throw away their beliefs in the name of getting along with other people. 
Paul clearly shows us how to engage in culture. I'm to listen to my culture. I find common ground. I show people the way. And ultimately, I'm going to point them to Jesus, which leads to my final point, engaging a broken world in a new or really an old way. You know, it's been said to be a successful fisherman, you don't look for the most comfortable spot on the bank. Instead, you go to where the fish are. Whenever I've been camping in the Rocky Mountains, my favorite spot is up a six and a half mile strenuous hiking trail to Lake Verna in the Rocky Mountain National Park. But the best fishing spot is not that lake. If you go to the top of Lake Verna and you're willing to get off the beaten path and you're also willing to wade through the shallow headwaters, you'll find a stream, a stream that feeds Lake Verna. It's overgrown. There's no path up the stream except through the stream. The banks are steep, so is the ascent. But it is one of the most productive trout streams anywhere in the world where nearly every cast is a catch. We literally only keep the fish that didn't survive the catch. We throw the rest of them back. That's the secret to great fishing. You have to go where the fish are. Most people don't have a strategy when they fish. They just cast out their, their line anywhere on the lake, hoping that something's going to bite. But they won't crawl through the brush. They won't get wet up to their waist in order to go where the fish are. Instead, their fishing spots are determined by what's most comfortable to them. If you want to win people to Christ, it can't or won't be done in a comfortable way. You're going to be around people who might make you feel quite uncomfortable. You might hear ideas that are completely at odds with what you believe. You might even find that they have no real interest in the God of the Bible at all. But still, we need to get out there on the river. We need to get to where the fish are. You know, as long as our outreach rests on getting people into our buildings, all we're really doing is moving fish from one live well to another. You know, it was the late Sam Shoemaker. He was an Episcopal bishop. He's one of the key men who helped to shape the 12-step movement. He summed it up like this. In the Great Commission, the Lord has called us to be like Peter, fishers of men. We've turned the commission around so that we have become merely keepers of the aquarium. Occasionally, I take some fish out of your fish bowl and put them into mine, and you do the same with my bowl. But we're all tending the same fish. So what are some important takeaways from Paul's example? The first thing I'd have to say is this. We need to identify with outsiders. You know, Lewis Smeads was a professor of philosophy and integration at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. He wrote a number of best-selling books, some great books on forgiveness. One of the books is called A Pretty Good Person. Now, in that book, he tells a story of what happened one hot August day at the Los Angeles County Jail. He'd gone there to bail someone out. It takes a long time, evidently, for them to process a prisoner's release, so he spent a good part of his morning just sitting on a bench and watching others as they came and they went. He talked about watching pimps come to bail out the prostitutes and, and drug dealers bailing out their peddlers and girlfriends bailing out boyfriends and drunks who'd been arrested the night before slinking out on their own. He described it as one long, never-ending, sleazy parade. He said by noon, he'd begun to see everyone as a full-time, obsessive-compulsive, addicted, hopeless loser. About mid-afternoon, Smeeds decided he was going to step out and get a cold drink. As he walked out, he met a lanky black, black man wearing a black suit with a priest collar. He figured the man was a prison chaplain, so Smeeds introduced himself on their way to the parking lot. Then he invited the man to join him at Denny's, which was right around the corner. As it turns out, the man wasn't a priest at all. He was an insurance salesman. He volunteered one day a week to visit those who were locked up in the county jail. He wore the priest outfit so that everyone would know what he was up to. Smeeds asked him, don't you keep meeting the same people coming in and going out, recidivists, repeaters, losers? And the man replied, well, every person locked up in that jail has got somebody with a key to let him out. But I meet people in my business every day who are locked up in a cell inside their hearts, and nobody on earth has a key to let them out. So I don't see an enormous difference between them and us. Smeed said this, okay, true enough, but still, aren't most of the men you meet inside this jail hardcore losers? And the man said, well, maybe they are, 
But that's not the way I divide up people. The, there are really only two categories of people I really care about, and that is forgiven people and unforgiven people. Later, when Smeeds got home, he told his wife, I met Jesus today. His wife said, oh yeah, what did he have to say? And Smeed said, he told me I was a Pharisee, that I have eyes, but I don't really see. When you look at society, when you look at the world, when you look at people with whom you vehemently disagree, what do you see? Do you see forgiven and unforgiven people? Or do you just see an enemy, a degenerate, a loser? Paul saw beyond the blasphemy of idolatry to see people who desperately needed to experience God's forgiveness. You know, another important takeaway is you and I must learn to discern times of heightened receptivity. Do you know that there are certain times in a person's life when they are more receptive to the gospel message than other times? For example, I want to talk to you about the gospel shot clock. In basketball, the shot clock tells you how many seconds you have to shoot the ball before you lose possession of it. The tension always builds as the seconds tick away and players try to beat the buzzer. But there's a shot clock infinitely more important than the one in a basketball game. In fact, it's one that has eternal consequences, and that's the gospel shot clock. It was George Barna who wrote this book called Transforming Children into Spiritual Champions. In his research, Barna found that the vast majority of people become Christians at a very young age. Relatively few accept Christ in their teenage years or later. Listen to what he said. If we don't reach a child for Christ by their 13th birthday, the chances are slim that we ever will. Now, statistically speaking, the best years to reach a person for Christ are in their first 12 years of life, which is why we call it the gospel shot clock. This is a major reason that we entered into this partnership with Lionheart Children's Academy. It's an opportunity for us to impact the next generation for Christ. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but preschool and after-school programs and summer school programs are all really dominated by secular companies today. That's a real missed opportunity for the church. When the church takes a leadership position in these industries, not only can we provide quality childcare at an affordable price, but we can show these kids during a time when they're most spiritually receptive just how much God loves them. You know, massive shifts have taken place in our economy, especially women's participation in the workforce over the last 50 years. And that has led to skyrocketing demand for childcare. Today, 83% of women with children work outside the home and 75% of them work full time. These working families, they need full time childcare beginning in infancy and all the way up to elementary school. Did you know that kids spend up to 50 hours each week in preschool from birth through pre-K? Other than sleeping, the preschool hours dominate much of a child's early years and development. So we started Lineheart to address this critical need in society, but at the same time, we want to reach into the, the, the young families who need to know also about the love of Christ. I hope that you tell your friends and your neighbors about the quality child, child care that's offered through your church. This is such a wonderful and worthwhile ministry that we're engaged in. Our heart's desire is to reach children with the love of God. But it's not just that young age that's a heightened time of spiritual receptivity. Another time is times of transition and tension. So when people are in transition or under tension, like just having made a move. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but the average American moves 11 times in their lifetime. That's a lot of uprooting, a lot of building new friendship, a lot of change. But there are other times of transitions like changing careers, uh, getting married, going through a divorce, having kids. Times of trans transition tend to be stressful times. They, they take an emotional toll. There are times when we need a lot of support and we have a lot of questions. They expose our weaknesses like few other things ever do. This is why it's important for us as a church to have ways of connecting to people in these times of transition, to offer things like an excellent children's uh, ministry, to, to offer financial classes, sermons on creating great marriages, which is a new series I'm gonna be doing in August. Things like grief share and divorce care. I don't know if you know this or not, but 
I actually started the first divorce care ministry at Spring Creek way back in the early days of the church, not because I have personal experience with divorce, but because I saw what happened to my mother after we, she went through a divorce and no one at church talked to her anymore, even though it was my father who cheated on my mother and abandoned the family altogether. You know, the better the church becomes at meeting people at their point of vulnerability, the more effective we'll be at bringing people to Christ. Churches that ignore issues like career and finances and marriage issue and addiction and parenting challenge and life crisis are churches who are refusing to meet people where they are and when they're most responsive to the gospel. I mean, how many people do you know right now who are really hurting in some area of their life? Truth of the matter is, everybody's hurting somewhere. If you're a human being, then you're going to experience a measure of pain, physical, emotional, relational, or spiritual. Currently, some 70 million Americans are struggling to find meaning and significance in their life. More than 25 million Americans are profoundly lonely. There's an estimated 50 million people a year who've had to endure a marriage that ended in divorce. Half of Americans in a recent poll said that they or their family members have suffered from depression. God's love has to be communicated from person to person and from heart to heart. We need to be responsive to people when they're most receptive. The final thing all of us really need to do is to learn to share our faith. You know, listen to this sad fact. George Barnes said, the average Christian in America today will die without ever having shared his faith in Christ with another person. That's tragic because most of us love sharing good news with our friends. If, if you discover a new restaurant you love, you'll tell all your friends about it. If you read an amazing book, you wouldn't hesitate to re recommend it to somebody else. But if you know the reason and purpose for life itself, if you know the source of strength in times of stress, consolation in times of loss, hope in times of hopelessness, wouldn't you want to share that with others too? Years ago, there was this great book. It was called How to Talk About Jesus Without Freaking Out. And in that book, they offered a simple pattern for sharing Christ. The pattern is summarized in three simple phrases. Their story, your story, his story. Any opportunity to share Christ always begins with listening to someone else's story. That's his first point, their story. So sharing Christ with others doesn't begin with Jesus or even with you. It begins with the other person. I mean, think about it. Most of us are annoyed by pushy salespeople who presume to know our needs without knowing us. Bottom line, people are not likely to accept a solution to a problem they don't believe they have or listen to answers to questions they've never asked. What I'm saying is, is there's a difference between someone who wants to win your soul versus someone who truly loves your soul. I, I, I don't think uh, that you can really listen to someone else's story unless you genuinely care about other people and want to learn about them. Besides, it's only in listening to their story that we find out where they're hurting, what they believe, what's working, what's not. That's where we find common ground. Did you know that Jesus never presented the gospel in the same way twice? Why? Because people all start from different places. He knew that because he always listened first. When you truly listen to someone else's story, they'll want to hear your story too. In fact, most of the time, they'll ask you for it. But it's like the old adage by Stephen Covey, unless you're influenced by my uniqueness, I'm not going to be influenced by your advice. Then there's your story. The truth is this, there's nothing more powerful than your own personal testimony. So when you tell your story, think in terms of three movements, before Christ, how I came to Christ, and after Christ. Take some time to think about how you would frame your story of coming to know Jesus through those three simple steps. Try to tell your story using that framework in under three minutes time, because that's about the average amount of time people are willing to listen to one another. We also need to be careful about this thinking that becoming a Christian is all about one set point in time. Let me explain. If I were to ask you, when did Peter in the Bible, when did Peter become a Christian? What would you say? Was it when Jesus called him to follow him and he dropped everything to follow Christ? I mean, that sure looks like total commitment to me. But what did Peter really know about Jesus at that point in the story? 
I mean, he didn't even understand who Jesus was at all. So was Peter's conversion experience more than halfway through the ministry of Jesus when people started walking away from Christ and Peter makes his amazing confession, Jesus, you're the Christ, the son of the living God? I mean, that certainly squares with our understanding of Christ and what we're called to believe. But if he really believed like that, why does he vehemently deny Christ before he's crucified? So maybe it was after the resurrection when Peter sees Jesus on the shoreline. He swims to him, confesses his sin. I mean, that's certainly in keeping with repentance. Or maybe it wasn't until Pentecost that Peter finally and fully surrenders to Christ. If you think about it, it's really hard to pinpoint a specific moment when Peter became a Christian. By the way, that's true of all the other disciples too. Truth be told, that's the way a lot of us actually are. It's hard to pinpoint the day and time when I finally and fully surrendered to Christ. I mean, honestly, sometimes I feel like my whole life has been about becoming a Christian. Because the truth of the matter is this, at every juncture in my life, I surrender as much of me as I know to as much of God as I understand. And both of those things are constantly changing. I become more and more in tune with who I am over time. So there's more of me to surrender to God. And my God image is healed gradually over time. So and I'm really coming to understand who he is. So at any given moment, I'm constantly surrendering as much of me as I know to as much of God as I understand. So the final thing we share is his story, Jesus' story. If a coworker came up to you tomorrow and said, I really want to be a Christian, but I don't know how, what would you tell them? If your child said, Mom, Dad, I want to invite Jesus into my heart, how would you do that? Would you know how to lead them to Christ or would you say, hold that thought, I'm going to call the preacher? Well, it's easy and is as simple as ABC. One, A is accept. The Bible says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe on his name. So we accept Jesus Christ, what he did for us on the cross. B is believe. Believe is to have faith. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. That's what the Bible says. And then C, C is for confess. The Bible reminds us if we confess our sins, he, that's God, is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. In fact, I have a great prayer for you can, you can have to lead other people to accept Christ. You can pray this prayer with me today if you don't know him in a personal relationship. There's nothing magical about these words, but saying these words in sincerity to God, meaning them in your heart, will open you up to this relationship, and I promise you, God will do his part. So maybe you'd like to pray this prayer with me right now. God, thank you for making me and loving me, even when I've ignored you and gone my own way. I realize I need you in my life, and I'm sorry for my sins. I ask you to forgive me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Please help me to understand it more. As much as I know how, I want to follow you from now on. Please come into my life and make me a new person inside. Please help me to grow now as a Christian. Friends, we are in a battle with evil. There are forces of darkness today that have many people ensnared. People desperately need to know Jesus. But that's just not going to happen as long as you and I keep seeing them as the enemy instead of what they actually are, victims of the enemy. And if you've never experienced the liberating power of the love of God, then you're going to erroneously think that your anger is going to change the world. It won't. It can't. We're not in a battle with them. We're in a battle for them. And that thinking makes all the difference. Would you pray with me now? Father, I just come to you acutely aware that what we see modeled in the example of the Apostle Paul is something that many of us as your followers have forgotten. That, Lord, there is a hurting, broken world out there. And there are things in this world that ought to provoke our anger. But we don't live in our anger. We don't express our outrage to the world. Instead, we funnel that. We channel that into doing something loving for you and for others. We understand, God, that, that idolatry not only desecrates you, but it desecrates people. That people are trapped up in these errors, trapped up in these things that ensnare them. And Lord, you've given us the challenge of coming alongside them and showing them your way. To do that, God, we've got to be good students of our culture. 
We've got to understand the shape of the God hunger in people today. We've got to be able to meet them with it where they are with what they really need. And so, God, I pray that being your church, that, God, we will lead in the example of this, that, God, we will go to where the fish are. We'll go to where people are, where people are falling through the cracks, where people are, are becoming lost, where people are losing their way and losing hope. That, God, we would be the infection of your love in the midst of that situation. I pray, God, that you would help us to, to take seriously this opportunity, this command that you left us to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. The Lord, we have, we have the gift of new life in us. And we want to be able to tell people, not just about the reality that we have new life, but how they can find it too. So Lord, I pray that we will be your church, that we will be the church that you made us to be, that we will be a church that's not so focused on getting people into the door as much as we are meeting people where they are. So Lord, I pray that you will have your way in each and every life. And if someone doesn't know you today and they prayed that prayer, that God, they would just lean into that and know that, that this, this journey is just that. It's a journey of getting to know you. That every day of our life is that, that, that passes, God, we're surrendering more, in our, more of ourselves to you. That we're finding, God, that, that you can be trusted. That you lead us into a satisfying life. That, Lord, your way and your love is the only way for us. And so, God, give somebody the courage to pray that kind of prayer in their heart today. I pray it all in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. You know, always at Spring Creek, if, if you ever make a decision as a result of a message, we'd love to hear about it. You can either email the church, you can put it in the commons, you can message any of the pastors. We'd love to be able to follow up with you, give you things that would help to resource you on this journey toward God or back to God. If you made a decision for Christ today and it was your first time to ever pray a prayer, inviting him into your life, then we definitely want to know about that. There are things that we'd love to put in your hands that would, would help you. We'd love to introduce you to other believers who are just like you, new in the faith and growing with Christ. And if today, if this message really resonated with your heart, do us the greatest compliment of all. Like it on social media and share it. Share it with other people so that we can understand God's heart for his church. God bless you and I hope you have a great week.